Good afternoon. Um, what I want to tell people first off is you would have got a handout that was distributed onto your tables about my talk. Um, as usual, um, I was writing it yesterday afternoon um, rather than getting everything ready for, uh, in advance for the packages, so brought them all out with me today. Um, just as a starting point, uh, I know people have been concerned a little bit about uh, the microphone systems, etc. Um, so do cue me if you're having trouble hearing. I'll try and talk louder, move. I, I do respond well to, like, you know, those hand signals that say move closer to the mic, etc. Um, I want to tell people that um, I do, when I get a little bit nervous, like when I'm in front of a group of uh, people, get or get talking about something which I'm passionate about, I tend to talk too quickly. I do get my hands going. Uh, I tend to try and cover too much information in a short time. I'm telling you this for three reasons. First of all, if I start every talk that way, it gives me a moment to anchor and orient to the situation. Second, it's a little bit of modeling because I think working with children with ADHD, knowing yourself, your own interactional style, is really tantamount to success in working with your kids. Um, and it's also a key part of what a psychological assessment is about. It's an approach to understanding the child or the individual their style in an effort to assist them in coping more optimally. Third and mostly important for this afternoon is so that you can cue me if I get really busy, um, I'm way too overwhelming or way too distracting, and I'll try and kind of modulate a bit. And you people who have uh, children with ADHD know that um, uh, encouraging and modeling and giving direct feedback about modulation is one of the key things you do every day about 20 million times with your kids. Just to give you a brief overview of who I am, I'm a registered clinical psychologist. I've worked in Peel Region uh, since 1988 in various hospital clinics uh, roles, and currently I work in a multidisciplinary private practice. Um, our group includes psychology, in our group we have psychologists, psychological associates, as well as behavioral consultant therapists who are mastered le master's level training in psychology. We also have speech language pathologists, and we have a consultative uh, linkage with occupational therapists. I am also a parent of my own special needs child, uh, who's now a young adult, who has a cluster of co-occurring disorders. Um, Bry has ADHD, he has Tourette's syndrome, he has obsessive compulsive disorder, a seizure disorder, and multiple developmental and learning based issues. Um, as a professional, I bring to my practice all my clinical and research experience. As a parent, I bring all the pa practical learning side about living with complex special needs kids. And the things you can never gain in a book. I have to say much of what I've learned about what works, what doesn't work, especially about dealing with schools, with agencies, with resources, and about how stressful the whole process can be for a family comes from living with a special needs youngster. Um, even as a professional who has a lot of background and experience um, and has kind of a recognized uh, expertise in dual diagnosis, um, I never cease to amaze how different it was to be sitting as a parent. And I too, uh, Georgina said, take someone with me. I learned very quickly not to represent myself, uh, but to take another professional who might say exactly what I would say to every meeting that I went to. Um, if, you're going, if you take away nothing else today, know that you have to become as informed as possible, if not an expert, to parent, negotiate your way through the service system and the stresses, and to be most helpful in ensuring long-term outcome uh, for your kids. In thinking about what I wanted to say today about psychological assessment, I realized that the whole area is really broad and diverse. Uh, my goal is really to provide you with the basics that you as a parent or educator need to be able to understand the ins and outs of assessment, the differences in assessors, goals and reporting, um, and the steps of an assessment and the basics to know what the information generated means, what comes out the other end so that you can understand your child and really develop strategies for intervention. Still a tall order, but let's see how well we can do in a short period of time. And I do hope to leave some uh, time to answer questions. Um, you can interrupt me, but I do tend to get a little tangential and distracted if you do that. So if we want to get through the agenda, if you can kind of hold them off as much as possible, that would be great. As a starting point, as a psychologist, as with any other professional, I do have some biases, and I want, before I proceed, to even let you know what they are, and, but they are in part why I'm here talking to you today. 
First of all, I'm a very strong advocate for comprehensive assessment, and I do believe that all children who have been diagnosed with ADHD or where there is a suspicion of ADHD should receive a comprehensive psych assessment at some point in the process of diagnosing, learning, and or treating the disorder. I know that knowing that access to assessments in a resource-poor mental health and educational community is difficult, and that private practice assessments are costly for families with more limited resources. I'm also struck how often, though, families do have extended third-party insurance through their drug and dental plans at work and aren't aware that those, that coverage exists for them to be able to get privately funded assessments. However, for an undiagnosed or newly di diagnosed child, let me say that there's a lot of reasons a kid can present in a classroom as inattentive, as distracted or disruptive uh, that may or may not have to do with ADHD. So I really think a detailed assessment will help clarify that confusion in this regard. Uh, for those who are diagnosed and who already have a diagnostic framework for understanding your child and that it fits, there's a number of reasons why you might still pursue a comp comprehensive assessment. First, when you have a child with a specific disorder or deficit, as a parent, you're facing the challenge of determining the best course of action for treating, for programming, for developing adjustment and coping strategies. A comprehensive assessment affords you the access to detailed information about an individual's function, which allows you to proactively guide the process with factual information with a, about your child, again, the whole child, with a model of what strategies are most likely to be uh, helpful, rather than trying a bunch of strategies that may or may not work for your individual child. Second, in children's mental health today, and I think Heidi referred to it this morning, there's an issue called comorbidity, which really comes into play. Comorbidity simply means that for any individual with one disorder or difficulty, there's a much higher frequency or chance that the same individual will have one or more other areas of difficulty. In fact, in my own doctoral research, which was on dual diagnosis back in the early 80s, uh, even in early research, and I worked with um, developmentally disabled uh, individuals with dual diagnosis, indicated that for the developmental disabilities that there was a 20 to 50 times more likely uh, diagnosis of an additional mental health problem if you had another developmental disability. That is a huge amount of people who have more than one thing going on. With ADHD, there's a very significant proportion. This morning, there was a lot of talk about uh, the comorbidity um, with studies ranging, you know, depending on their criterion, up to 70 to 80 percent with co-occurring learning issues or disorders. A further 50 to 60 percent may have co-occurring and one or more persistent tics uh, or repetitive motor or vocal mo movements. Amongst our Tourette kids, approximately up to 90 percent will also have some form of ADHD. We have 30 to 60 percent of ADHD individuals who have comorbid issues with anxiety and or have preval higher prevalence of other mood-related disorders like depression. And I think Heidi mentioned amongst our adult ADD women, there's a very high uh, comorbidity with depression and anxiety-based diagnoses and disorders. So it's really important to know about any comorbid issues. One way to be able to address comorbidity, uh, to intervene early and proactively, is to have a comprehensive assessment, which allows to look at not just the ADHD, but at learning, at emotional functioning, at the systemic issues that are happening for a child. And finally, I think it's a way for you to not work harder, but to work better in working with your child. Third, and I think a point that um, I think that needs to be made here today, and a key for any family uh, who hasn't had an assessment in this room, it becomes essential for any child with ADHD in Ontario to have a set, an assessment, because within our current educational structure and system of identification, um, of a child with specialized learning needs, ADHD does not in and of itself qualify for formal identification. You heard that this morning, um, but I think one of the keys to getting an identification um, and an additional uh, identification is to have a comprehensive psychoed assessment at minimum because that allows you then to go after the associated learning-based difficulties or the LD specifically, which will assist the child to qualify for those accommodations and or modifications in their academic academic supports that they need for life. Um, this is very different from individuals with ADHD living in the U.S., where educational accommodations come with ADHD and its sequelae, regardless of the comorbid designation. 
Some of our children do meet criterion, again, under the behavioral category, but, and while this is key for children with very significant behavioral-based outcomes of the regulatory problems with inhibition and impulse control, it does not provide a recognition of the biological basis of difficulties, um, and again, because often behavior is considered under personal choice and personal control, uh, but more importantly, it's also not optimal for focusing over the long term on the learning struggles which result in poor outcomes outcomes that have really plagued many of our kids with ADHD throughout their lives. Uh, perhaps as one what might one consider a secondary bias, I also believe, uh, especially in this province under the current educational structure, that as a psychologist, it's essential that we identify the learning-based issues which are keys to educational success as learning disabilities and not simply associated features of ADD. Because we know that our group of kids who have ADD are very prone to active working memory problems, executive function difficulties. I can't tell you how many times I've read reports uh, by my colleagues, and certainly I respect a gr great number of my colleagues, but who talk about these as associated sequelae to ADHD and not learning difficulties in and of themselves. Um, as, they, as if they don't have real impact on learning, on school-based acquisition, and on long-term success. This is very important because the writing of a report based on the same psychological tests and outcome can either facilitate your efforts to advocate for identification and an IEP or can impede the process and give information which says, well, there's no indication or no definition of a learning disability here. So it's imperative in your efforts as families when you're getting an assessment done, albeit through the school board, uh, through community health agencies, or through private practitioners, that you ask questions. Ask the assessor that's working with your child about their model of understanding learning disabilities and their position with respect to ADHD and LD, whether the learning issues and active working memory, executive functioning, etc., are simply an association or a sequelae, or whether they constitute a learning disability specifically. Because as a practitioner who's outside of the system and often works with families, there is a real political process in writing a report. That supports or hinders the process. As a professional, I've read a number of different reports. There's certainly a great deal of variability in reporting practices. Reports will vary in length, in depth, and sadly, in the degree to which there's a conceptualization of difficulties or an integration of the test results that give meaningful recommendations and strategies to assist others. Often I'll read reports that will report a ton of scores but never get to the bottom line that says what does this mean, what will the outcome be, and what should we be doing about it. And if I can say anything to my other professionals in the room is make sure you do that. Um, at the bottom line, even in the diagnosis of a difficulty, there's a lot of variability. If you don't have an assessment already, do so and ask the questions about philosophy and model with respect to ADHD and LD, about what to expect from the report, the recommendations and follow-up. A lot of psychologists in the private practice may send you a report but may or may not do a school linkage or advocacy um, directly with agencies and that's really an important piece. If you've already had an assessment, I've also had a number of families come to see us who are very disappointed or feel that something was missed or it didn't seem to capture their child. Um, even if you need more information to make use of materials that are in an assessment, all is not lost. You can go back to the assessor and ask more questions. Alternatively, it's okay to seek additional consultation from another psychologist and or adjunctive testing for yourself or your family. For example, many times in our practice, we see children who've already had previous testing, and we may use that information for treatment or intervention planning with a child. We can often, as psychologists, access the original raw data that came from an assessment and use that data to help families understand the needs in program or to add and advocate for the school uh, with respect to programs that's needed. In the back of the little handout that I gave you, I included closed a definition of learning disabilities, which is adapted from LDAO, uh, which can act as a key model for understanding what LD is and help you uh, to be able to get your head around it. Briefly, the key is that there is an impairment in psychological processes related to learning, be that language, spatial reasoning, functioning, etc., which exist in combination with otherwise average essential abilities and capacities. If you look at individuals with ADHD, 
We have to look at those essential psychological processes which, in, which constitute an LD. For example, this morning there was a lot of talk about memory and attention, a lot of talk about executive functions which are central to ADHD. And certainly I'm going to talk a little bit as I get further along with issues related to something called processing speed and efficiency, which is really how quickly and efficiently you can process and produce information. Our kids with ADHD are often very inefficient processors, even if at the end of the day they can get a lot uh, accomplished. These processing struggles result in difficulties with the acquisition or production of various academic skills. It may result in a delay and many school boards, not all, are kind of stuck on the issue of a discrepancy between scores and achievement in terms of being able to do that. Alternatively, even in children who are accomplishing at grade level, it impacts on the amount or degree of energy, effort and persistence that's required to produce this information. For many families, it's really this latter group which is very difficult to get identified and very difficult um, to be able to get resourced. For example, if you take a, as a small example a child who gets a B or a level 3 on a specific test or assignment, they can get that score in different ways. Some children may be able to listen in class, spend a short time generating the information, spend 10 to 15 minutes at home writing out a good copy, studying for test. The result is a level B uh, or level 3 product based on our current uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 scoring system. Another child may listen in class, may then have to ask the teacher multiple questions repetitively, um, may come home with apparently no knowledge of the discussion, even though there has been a class presentation and multiple repetitions of the information, um, then requiring parents to get on the internet, draw on their own knowledge base, call other parents, assist in organizing, generating and reviewing perhaps multiple times information, spending three plus hours pulling your hair out to get preparation time and focus focused to get something down on paper um, and they spend hour to two hours every day for several days to get a B on a test. At the end of the day, the child gets the B. For the first child, life is good. For the second child, even if they look good on paper, they have very significant issues, which at some point, when the demands for task initiation, organization, completion, and the volume of work demands accrue, because there is an upwards curve from junior to intermediate to secondary, and God forbid, post-secondary education, result in a crash in their ability to manage, cope, and be successful. It's this group which is overlooked in schools especially, um, and I think in part that's because there are limited available financial resources. In Ontario, some schools don't have access uh, to psychologists in assessment. Others may have access to only one to three assessments per year, per school. They have to prioritize. The very delayed child or the extremely disruptive child will get on the list first. Our second student, who does okay, but works tediously and forever with the important and, pro and primary approach of parents to support them, doesn't stand a chance of even making the list, let alone getting identified and getting the accommodations they need. I have a child um, like this second student, um, and I found that you have to get your own resources no matter what to get the assessment done. Not to sound too derogatory for what is an excellent group of my colleagues, the bottom line is that it may be hard to get an assessment which is funded, and even then, the same data can lead to minimal or tremendous amounts of information and programming strategies, depending on the assessor. It's important for you as a family because you are a consumer of an assessment, that you know when you're making decisions about how, where, and the best approach to be assessment, and it is important to be informed. While privately funded assessments are expensive, um, you have to weigh out the long-term value and outcome, because sometimes it's an expense that can pay off for years to come. I think it's also important because I certainly support that not all families have resources and have worked in publicly funded agencies over the years, is you have to also be aware when you're getting assessments that are really there are different consumers of psychological reports. And it's the consumers that guide the information and the orientation of what's presented. And I think it's really important to consider that the primary consumer of the information and who is the employer of the assessor can alter 
speaker, the type, the orientation of information that's presented, particularly in publicly funded assessments. And as a psychologist who writes them, I really think that that's partly sometimes my colleagues get criticized, but it's partly because they work for a different consumer group. When I write a report, I'm thinking that there's always four different consumers who are getting a report. Each one of them has different wants, needs, and desires with respect to what the report is, what the goals, and even the outcome they want from the information. And I think it's little wonder then that they're difficult to write, but also that it's hard to meet all needs and that there's huge variability. That's why you as a parent needs to be informed and really need to feel comfortable getting the information. Obviously, in a private practice, the primary consumer for me is often the parent or the individual being assessed in the case of adults. But when a, child want, when a parent wants their child assessed, it's because they have concern about their child's functioning, albeit learning and development, behavior and emotion, or in presentation in the family. There are two factors. You're worried sick about your kid, and you're worried sick about you may have caused something because of all the rhetoric you hear, and you want answers. What's wrong? What caused it? How can I fix it? As a parent, you need to know your child's strengths as well as weaknesses. You need information to understand what it means for them now, in the future, and also to have reason to hope. The child often feels they're stupid or bad, even if that's not something they've said directly. As an individual whose assess gets older, there's also having to sort through the mixed messages that they've got. Adolescents and young adults know even if they've had learning struggles, they often have a very limited understanding of what that was, but they sure know what the pain involved was in the educational process. And there's often a ton of secondary issues with self-esteem and their emotional functioning. So writing a report for the family group of consumers has really got to be geared towards answers and directions. But I think it's important because not all assessments are geared that way. The second group is what we call direct service providers. These are the people like teachers, uh, resource teachers, who are spending, uh, resource workers, tutors, who spend direct time with your child. They want to look at the profile of strengths and weaknesses. They want to use it to set up systems within a class or school or alternatively in home for tutoring. They're interested in understanding the ups and downs in a profile, but they also want to look for what's a doable program with suggestions that will help to manage. Often, um, those of us in private practice get criticized that we make recommendations that aren't doable, that aren't able to be implemented within boards or systems, and it's really important that you hit both sides. Assessments completed at the school level are partially for the direct service providers, for the teachers, the resourcing staff. But I also think you need to know that they are partially, and perhaps more importantly, for the service coordinators. And in this case, the coordinator is the more political process. They're looking for a diagnosis. They are looking at specific scores to determine if the child fits what's often an ambiguous set of criterion in terms of managing for identification and qualification. This group is interested in eligibility primarily, and they are primarily interested in what your child can't do. Funding and supports in this province follow needs, not successes. So it's important to know that if you get a school or an agency-based assessment, don't get me wrong, they're wanting to support teaching needs and help, but they're primarily seeking information about whether a child meets the criterion for supports in their system. That's where there may be variability. Often I've read school psych reports where they may describe ADHD to a T but never even reach a formal diagnosis in the report about ADHD. Simply they might refer families to a pediatrician or a doctor based on their observations and scores and leave the diagnostic piece to the doctors. Next, they're working with a group of individuals who understand scores, who know the terms and the processes to follow. So sometimes the reports are filled with tons of numbers and information and the parents left with, I don't know what this means at all because you've never been trained in statistics and interpreting what's a scaled score, what's a percentile rank, what does this mean in terms of my child's functioning. As a parent, it's important to note that the key audience for the, some of these assessments is often the internal group, those who are educated in the basics, who knows what a score means, and who are geared to that in-school educational audience. That can make things really easy or difficult for your child. At times, I've met with families who've had great feedback and good understanding. Other times, very limited feedback. 
When I meet with a family at the outset, I often spend about two hours going over the child's history. Um, at the end, I spend over two hours going over the results, the test information, what it means and where to go. I've talked to families who have not ever been interviewed or phoned prior to an assessment to give information to an assessor when they've gone into one of the agency assessments or perhaps have spent 20 to 30 minutes on the telephone at the outset or who have gone into a meeting to get assessment results which last 20 minutes to half an hour with the assessor but also includes an overwhelming group of people the principal, the CERT, uh, the teachers, um, someone representing uh, speech language department then we have parents who walk away having heard a whole lot but with no knowledge, partly because they're emotionally overwhelmed, partly because the information has been discussed at a level that they can't digest in the heat of the moment. Then they may get a report back that's way too short for them to be able to make the interpretation. Subsequently, in these kind of situations, your child may be served well, but subsequent teachers in the forthcoming years may or may not get the information that's been laid out and you really have to become your child's advocate. The fourth group that's really important because I think um, sometimes families come and they've taken information to the medical community and are still finding that they don't seem to know quite what to do with it is that the medical community is a consumer but they also have a different agenda. That is a place you can get publicly funded assessments, often through some of the mental health clinics. Um, I know in my work there, however, their primary issue was on diagnosis, not on um, educational strategies, as well as those diagnostic information leading to appropriate medical decision making, or in the clinic settings, towards goals related to mental health and treatment but not so much school and learning. So your assessment bent may be more geared towards those behavioral intervention, which are important, but may not hit you in both ways. Neuropsychologists do excellent assessments, but their assessments are often geared towards brain function and the implication, less geared towards strategy-based intervention around what you're going to do about it. It's not that they don't intend to give recommendations, but I think they're writing to a different audience. And I think it's really important that when you get an assessment done that you know who the audiences are and you know what you need to have done especially in a resource poor world, again, because we know the problems are lifelong and they don't go away, but resource systems are working very much towards limiting hours spent with individual families and trying to get more numbers through in a shorter time, which puts a lot of pressure even on our assessors to be able to, to do less rather than more in terms of finding out about your child. It's important also to know that if you've had an assessment that isn't geared to what your needs or is falling short, it doesn't mean the information can't be used to develop alternatives. And again, be that going back to the person who did the assessment and asking the alternative, this was great information about what we should do from a mental health perspective, tell us what should happen at school, um, or going elsewhere to people who can interpret test results and integrate that information in a different way and gear it towards development of educational strategies. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit with that, all that said and talk about the nitty gritty of it. I want to cover some information quickly so that if you're reading a report, you have some practical pieces of information about that report. First of all, I'm going to skim quickly through what an assessment is. Very simply, an assessment is a standardized situation in which a person's behavior is sampled, observed and described. It can be done in multiple ways with rating scales, individual tests, behavioral observations. A comprehensive assessment should include multiple sources of information, parents, teachers, child ratings, standardized evaluation, which compares your child to other children of their age. By doing standardized evaluation, you're getting uniformity in testing procedures, you're getting an eye towards reliability, which are tests that are repeatable and precision of, in, of measurement. You're also getting validity in that they're geared towards assessing specific aspects. The observations that can occur in the context of an assessment and in the internal environment become part of an assessment, but the normative data is essential. There's basically three types of an assessment that are done by psychologists. What I can say, and certainly with a child with ADHD, the first two are essential. A cognitive assessment really looks at the individual's abilities and achievement in learning. 
Part of this assessment, there's often an examination of multiple psychological processes. Language, both receptive and expression, nonverbal or visual perception, reasoning and problem solving, visual motor skills, abilities in memory, attention, executive functions. Often they start with a test, something called a uh, Weschler intelligence test for children, fourth edition. Uh, with younger kids, it's a preschool and primary. With adults, it's an adult intellectual achievement test that has about 14 different tasks that tap very functions. There are alternatives such as the Stanford Binet or Differential Ability Scale for children. Uh, note, if you have had previous testing and you're going because you're not happy with the testing for an, a second opinion, some tests can't be repeated within a certain time frame because of that reliability and validity. So if you don't want to hand the new assessor the report, I have lots of families that don't want me to see what was written before, if you want a second opinion, please tell them what was already done so that they can use alternative measures to get the same information. Because if you've had a WISC done and you go to another assessor because you don't agree and they did a WISC three months later and they take it back to the school board, they're going to say, wait a minute, this test was only done three months ago. The information is of questionable val validity if there's differing results. So it's really important that you keep that information in mind. Skills such as the ability to read, write, or do math are really achievement-based skills. They're based on exposure, but they're also based on the individual's processing abilities. They're an outcome. Again, a student in grade three who, can't, who struggles to read may have difficulties for lots of reasons. And it's the combination of issues which is important from a diagnostic standpoint in determining what a learning disability is. You've all heard, as parents who've got diagnoses of ADHD, that there isn't one test for ADHD. Absolutely, that's true. But there are tests that load for processes like attention. For example, there's a number of tests like uh, a continuous performance tests, which look at auditory sustained attention and visual measures of attention. There are attention-based factors on many of the memory tests. It's important for parents to know that that's the basis. It's the underlying function that's the basis of the learning process issue, not the ADHD itself. And I think even more importantly, with recent research in the area of cognitive features, um, it's really important that we have those kinds of assessments done in detail because in the field we are really heading to more towards considering ADHD as a disorder of executive function. We now have the DSM-4, which Heidi was talking about uh, this morning. Sam Goldstein was at OPA in the last couple of days talking about the DSM-5, uh, where they're really moving towards ADHD um, and looking more at the impact or functional impairments plus the underlying biological process and, in fact, defining is it a deficit or disorder of executive functions rather than as a... Um, attentional problem per se. So I think that's coming. Um, the executive functions in the brain, as I think Heidi already covered, are those groups of skills that are responsible for guiding and directing cognitive, behavioral, and emotional functions. They're active during novel problem solving, where there's an emphasis on goal-directed behavior, where you have to do selecting of goals, planning, monitoring, and use feedback and decision making. There's really two key groups of executive functions, what we call beha behavior and affect regulation skills. Those are your ability to inhibit behavior and impulse, to make shifts. We were talking about inflexibility this morning in managing behavior and problem solving, and to look at the degree to which we can handle emotional control of their ability to modulate our responses. Second, we have metacognitive skills, which is really, in a simple way, the ability to think about thinking. In the ADHD area, these are skills that are often significantly impaired, and it's those impairments that last a lifetime and that kill us within the school system because it goes way beyond the day-to-day -day learning of reading. And certainly the ability to generate or initiate tasks, get it broken, take a task, break it down, anticipate the parts, time management, decide how long it's going to take to get it to complete it and get started. The ability to plan and organize, which involves both current and future-oriented task demand, the ability to anticipate the future, to develop stretch, 
steps to do a task analysis, the ability to organize materials, the ability to self-monitor. The good news is that many of our school boards, despite the fact that they do not accept ADHD uh, in and of itself, are accepting executive functioning based deficits as real and as constituting identifiable learning disabilities if the wording is correct in a report. So there is a move towards executive functioning um, becoming sort of the overviewing principle for ADHD, but it's a long way off in the real world. Uh, the hope is with the DSM-5, uh, we all, we're generously thinking we're looking at 2012, uh, that might be very generous uh, given that these are committee-based uh, discussions and uh, generation, um, but there's really going to be a strong orientation to not seeing um, ADHD uh, in and of itself, but as looking at that biological, uh, psychological processes. It's going to be a long way coming. That may or may not help us. Uh, those of us in the political side worry that if DSM-5 calls it an executive functioning uh, based deficit, that there's a decision then that since ADHD didn't qualify and this is just what ADHD is, then it shouldn't qualify either. But there's those of us who are say, well, we'll have made it a moot point because there's a recognition of that process as an identifiable and real problem. I'm going to switch over a little bit now and talk about, um, well, uh, let me skip because I'm not going to get through everything. Um, behavioral assessment, you've talked a little bit about why, why do we look at behavior, um, why do we look at functional demands and situation. The other thing I want to say two seconds about before I talk about scores is emotional personality assessment. Um, because I think that doesn't always get done uh, in terms of managing and not that it's always essential to be done but I think if you've got children who are having secondary sequelae of their ADHD or having other issues it's really important that that area does get looked at. Why? Because of comorbidity with anxiety disorders with depression um, and some of the early, earlier more proactive research now that's going on with bipolar disorder. Um, they can include standardized structured tests and or more projective tests. I will say that in this case, when we're looking at emotional personality functioning, we're looking at self-image and self-esteem at the child's view of the world, of themselves, others, their way of dealing with emotions and conflicts. This is an, it may or may not be an essential piece depending on the child we're talking about. It's certainly not a part of a standardized psychoeducational battery. There's pros and cons to that. You may miss part of the whole child, but depending on the assessor, it is something you may prefer. And I will say that because um, it can lead to misinterpretation. I know, as an aside, I have read some school-based reports where uh, emotional personality assessment has been included, um, where it was really misplaced because it's sitting on a school record talking about significant mental health, uh, defensive structures, orientation, and it's been quite catastrophic for the child, actually. And sometimes it's been very difficult for parents because they haven't been as involved in providing the background and the contextual information for interpreting emotional information, so then it gets mislabeled. Um, or it may be uh, a support of a behavioral, emotional type designation um, as the primary concern and a way to, s to dismiss learning. So I think to f as families, it's not essential that you do emotional personality assessment is what I'm saying. It can be very helpful if you're thinking there may be comorbid issues. And it's also going to be really important if you're getting an agency and or school board assessment that you talk very frankly about whether or they will or will not be doing that and that you give informed consent about whether it's okay or not okay for them to do that. Um, because you don't own the information if agencies do the assessment. You go to a private practitioner, you have control of what gets released. Um, if it's done by the school board, it becomes part of the school uh, record. You can have it removed, as um, Georgina talked about this morning, but I've certainly seen some interesting things, including an assessment with, that was done when my son was quite young. Um, and we actually sent formal documentation requesting the assessment to be removed, took it through the superintendency at the board. I went to his OSR in high school for uh, some associated reasoning. I was looking at something and actually found my letter requesting the withdrawal of this psych assessment stapled to the psych assessment. <laughs> which then meant now everybody's going to read it because there's a letter requesting its withdrawal attached to the assessment rather than the opposite way around, which is I've substituted another assessment that I really would prefer that you use to interpret. 
interpret the information. So you really have to be cautious about what happens in that side of things. Okay, what's involved in an assessment is sort of detailed on that little handout. Why do we do it? Uh, what is it doing? I want to talk a little bit, and I'm going to skip over to, if you look in the handout, there's a page that has this lovely uh, bar graph curve on it, which is a normal uh, distribution of intelligence because I really want to talk a little bit about understanding the terms and the types of scores that are in there. Often reports, now they vary too. I've read psych reports where no one puts any scores at all in the report. They just put broad categories. If that's the case, you need to know the terminology and what it means so that if on a standard score, most kids will fall collectively in the average range. Average in this case is good. It means just as smart as everybody else. We have high average, superior, and uh, very superior or gifted children. We have low average, what I call borderline, and uh, developmentally handicapped. Um, and I say over the years, terminology has changed. We used to call these children mentally retarded. It became me mentally deficient. It became intellectually deficient. Now we have something called mild intellectual deficit. We now call children developmentally challenged. We've changed the words to make it nice, but it's basically the same standardized scores in terms of what we're doing. I think it's really important that you know that if you only, in a report, get broad basis, that you have to understand what they mean. Because if you have scores in a report that say the child is below average or much below average in a report with no scores, I'm surprised at how often those terms are thrown in and families think the child's just a little bit behind. When in fact, below average can often mean borderline which means the child may function only as well as two to nine out of a hundred kids their age. That's not just a little bit behind. That is a huge deficit that's going to cause very significant difficulties. Um, we'll see terms like slow learner thrown into a report. Slow learner usually means borderline deficit range functioning. It doesn't mean they're just a little bit behind. And it's really important that people understand when those terms are there. When you look at that, that scale, what I tried to do was show you kind of the normal distribution of scores. Underneath, I've put things like, what are the standard scores and how do you interpret them? And I think because often you'll get in a report, you will often, if you get scores, you will often get something called percentile ranks. Percentile ranks tell you the degree to how your child functions relative to the normal population. So that a child who's functioning at the 50th percentile does as well or better than 50 out of 100 children their age. That's important, particularly when you're looking at extreme scores. So that a child who's scoring at the second percentile is only doing on that particular activity as well as two out of 100. So that doesn't, that's not real good in terms of managing and knowing what those scores mean are helpful. Some of the screening-based measures will include stay nine scores, which are just broad categories of scores. So what I tried to do on that little map, take this map with you as you're reading your report, is chunk down what stay nines represent. Rarely in a psych report, um, I've seen it sometimes with, where people just give a graph with standard scores. I don't like that. Where there's standard score equivalents are written down and they are written kind of squeezed in underneath of what a standard score equals in terms of a percentile rank. So that a standard score of 6 is equal to a percentile rank of 9. A standard score of 10 is, is the same as a 50th percentile score. Um, that gives you some basic information between understanding the scores. When you're reading a report, Report, I think what you, the next page has a couple of little graphs or the next couple of page on what's in a global score. When we do a psych assessment, it's kind of on a pyramid system. And what I mean by that is the WISC has four different groups of skills or factors of skills. 
Those scores are thrown together to give us a global score or a global estimate of a child's intellectual functioning ability. What you need to know is a global score may tell us a whole lot or absolutely nothing about your child. And how that's demonstrated on the next page is we've got global score, I hit 50th percentile, and the first one is your total score. Child A may get that global score at the 50th percentile because everything is within the average range. All their skills are roughly the same. Child B, who has scores in the borderline range and scores in the superior range, when you do statistics, may come out average. That is not an average profile. You can't fake good on these tests. If you've got skills in the superior range, you've got incredible strengths. If you've got scores down in the second percentile, you've got very significant deficits. You may get that same score, and I sort of talked over it because it then breaks it down to kind of more visual and verbal processing. Again, it might be because all of the scores are at the same level, or you might also have something that we call bimodal distributions. So child B under the verbal and visual is more of our bimodal kid, where we've got scores that are in the basement and scores that are way up at the top. Amongst our ASD kids, for example, if we talk about language skills, often our, AS, our very bright ASD or Asperger's kids may do extremely well on tasks like fund of information, which are factual knowledge-based tasks, and may have huge difficulties on tasks such as comprehension, which requires the child to answer a series of open-ended questions and generate and organize multiple ideas. Okay, so they may have a scaled score way up at the top. They may have another one way down the bottom. At the end of the day, we may say, oh, they're verbally average. No, <laughs> that's not exactly true. Yes, globally they're average, but it's not meaningful. And that's where it becomes really important to go through any assessment that has been done on your child with a fine-tooth comb and to figure out what do those scores mean and what's, what do we do about those. Similarly, in a global score or a full-scale score, your child may be adequately or inadequately represented. The next, paragraph just, uh, next page just sort of looks at to get the same global score, you may have excellent... Um, language skills and very poor visual skills. You may have excellent visual skills and very poor language skills globally. When we're talking about interpretation of psychological assessments, this becomes really important because I think sometimes, especially in resource poor worlds or uninformed audiences, hold that for one minute, the easy profiles get interpreted quite well and run through the system very smoothly. So if you've got a child who's got fabulous nonverbal skills across the board and has terrible language scores on every test that we give them, it doesn't and can't read and write, it doesn't take a lot to say they have a language-based learning disability. They're in pretty easily because the whole global profile looks like that. Our kids with that huge scatter or our kids with that bimodal distribution often, not often, but can be interpreted as, well, at the end of the day, they're average. Everybody has individual differences. Ugh. Okay, you're missing the boat. Because, in fact, our LD kids are those spikes and peaks kids. They're the kids that have great strengths and huge deficits all in their same little body. And it's the discrepancy between their strengths and weaknesses that tells you the most about how they're functioning in terms of managing. So it's really essential that we don't use a simplistic model of understanding and identifying learning disabilities. And it does sometimes require a little bit more fine-tuning in terms of the management system. And I think especially, I, I like to use the example around um, looking at these kinds of things because we know that our kids with ADHD have got kind of shortchanged because of some of the issues like doing okay at the end of the day because they put in or the families put in amazing amounts of energy, efforts, etc. And I think as a psychologist, it's not always easy to assess what's going on for a kid because we find that, for example, you may have a specific kind of disability 
even after we talk about scores and discrepancies, that doesn't show up well on preliminary tests. And I will use the WISC as an example. I love the WISC. I do the WISC all of the time. But children, I, and I've run a ton of reports where families come in to me and say, you know, my kid just doesn't seem to get language. They can't seem to organize. They can't produce an idea. It just doesn't come out. And they gave them this WISC, and they said, well, they scored average. They don't have a language problem. Okay. Well... They may or may not have a language problem. The WISC does have a number of language-based tasks. However, those tasks do not heavily uh, look at receptive and auditory processing of language. There are not high receptive processing demands. Plus, what's in a score? For example, many of the tasks on the WISC, you get two points for the best answer, one point if you're in the ballpark, zero points if you can't tell us anything about the information, and it's based on content, not process. So the kid that gives us some basic content that has information may score well. Kids that can't generate anything, I don't know, skip it, or don't give you any information, it's easy to move on. I have ki my language kids that I call my much ado about nothing kids, which you ask them a question and they gave you a four paragraph answer on every question. Somewhere embedded in that four paragraph question is some content that's relative and kind of means you kind of know it, but you had a hard time hitting the main idea with topic maintenance, organizing and formulating the idea, succinctly summarizing information, drawing conclusions based on that information, huge what we call higher order language problems, which may not be tapped depending on the test you give. And that's really important when we've got screening-based assessments that are done sometimes by agencies and sometimes by our psychologists within the school board who only have a certain number of hours to spend with the kid and may only be able to give one or two tests. So they only give the whisk and they can only make their conclusions based on that. You may have a huge language problem that doesn't get detected. Similarly, in the nonverbal area, we have kids who do, with our nonverbal based learning disabilities, who do really well on tasks where there's structure and organization, where all the information they need to solve the problem is right in front of them. Give them a task where they have to integrate and pull together the information, they have huge difficulties. The WISC-3 used to have a task, for example, called object assembly, where we scattered a bunch of pieces and the child had to pull it together to make a puzzle, to make it, to make it look like a soccer ball or a face. In the WISC-4, we took that out. So we took the task that loaded heavily on integration out of the test and out of the score. Most of the tasks on the WISC-4 have an incredible amount of structure. There's models, there's templates, there's chunks to follow. Our kids who do really well in those will look good, but they still may have huge difficulty pulling information together. So I think it's really important then that we don't just rely on a short realm of test. That's also why it becomes a little bit more labor intensive as a psychologist because you can't just take a score. You have to be attentive to what's going on in the process and you have to follow up with testing that taps the areas that you're observing to be a deficit. Because if you don't, you're going to miss a whole lot. And it's our kids with ADHD who tend to have lots of strengths mixed in with all of those incredible deficits that often fall through the cracks. My experience is that school boards are moving towards acceptance of executive function-based deficits as real and as constituting an identifiable learning disability. 
And that move is very helpful for us because that's a move towards an executive function-based conceptualization of ADHD and a willingness then to include them in processes. But you have to document them as real and not just a sequelae of the ADHD itself. Well, that's an interesting concept. Can you use the words? Yes. Might it politically be bought? Not so sure. Because uh, have you done, what have you done to assess executive functions? Have you done standardized tests? Have you done a conceptualization in terms of managing? Lots of OTs do a lot of things. And again, it's that whole, is it a diagnostic term that comes into play? And the diagnosis of learning disability is a regulated act. What can you say or not say? I would encourage you to use those words because they are recognized and there's really a movement um, within the school system to look at executive function as, as, a, as a real and viable reason for identification and accommodation. Well, first of all, you need a full assessment. You need a psychoeducational assessment that looks at all areas, including the child's executive functions. There are tests on the market, as those of us who are psychologists do a lot of testing, there are tests that specifically gear towards executive functions. There are behavior ratings that gear towards the executive and organizational functions. For example, there's a scale called the BRIEF, the Behavior Rating Inventory of Executive Functions, which is a parent and a teacher rating scale that documents real life behaviors that are often associated with executive function deficits. Um, there are sections of a test called the NEPSI that will look at executive functions. There's a Dallas Kaplan executive function scale that now has about 15 different standardized tests that look at executive functions in a specific categories. Many psychological assessments, even if they don't specifically target executive functions, will include things that look at active working memory, will it look at planning and organizational skills, which are kind of the basis for executive functions. What's the truth? Okay, well, you know, you're going to get my bias, and prior to going into private practice, I was the clinical director of a specialized preschool service, so uh, I'm a strong, uh, in, strong advocate for early identification and intervention. It's never too soon to be able to identify, um, so it's bunk uh, in terms of managing. But basically, it's never too soon. However, we do know preschool brains are changing very quickly and rapidly so that issues that are identified at the preschool level can vary. But we also know, based on tons of research on learning disabilities, particularly in the area of reading, that early identification and early intervention are a key to success. In fact, there's a ton of research now that's suggesting that if children aren't reading well by grade three, Two, okay, I'm going to say three generously, they will have reading difficulties for the rest of their life. So if you wait till a child's in grade three, four, five, or six to assess, you've missed the boat in terms of being able to get the level of intervention and support needed to reduce the degree of impairment caused by the difficulties. And when to reassess. Okay, the first time to assess, obviously, is at the diagnostic level because you're looking for as much information as you can to get the best program, the best interventions, and the best strategies. In terms of when do I consider reassessment important, I say natural transition points. So if you've had a child assessed at the preschool or as they're entering school, sometimes we've seen kids as young as two, then we want to do some updated assessment when they're just before they're entering school, then you're looking at transition. What are our key transitions in school? Transition to junior grades in terms of the way the curriculum switches, transition to senior public, transition to secondary, and absolutely transition to post-secondary. At this point, there's been some real change at the post-secondary level, and I'm doing a ton of reassessments on 
uh, individuals entering the post-secondary level because for accommodations they will do them based on old assessment but for bursary supports for funding for adaptive technology for example um, based on OSAP funding and government um, granting procedures you need an assessment that's no more than 18 months old or you 18 months or you will not qualify for additional bursary supports. You may still get accommodations like being able to write exams uh, in a separate room, but you will not get uh, funding-based supports based on an old assessment at the post-secondary level currently. Can you get accommodations for a preschooler? Absolutely, you can get accommodations for a preschooler. Um, my experience is, in, in fact, and not to, be, not to be cynical towards schools, is that I've certainly found the daycare system much more accommodating um, in terms of identification and issues. If you have a preschool-aged child who's presenting with significant delays or difficulties, even those that might be based on behavior regulatory systems or attention regulation systems, you are often able to get very early access to government funding and resources, such as special services at home, resource teachers that consult to daycares, um, teaching assistant support within the daycare system, because the criterion for identification at the preschool level is often two or more areas of difficulty, not necessarily a, diag a pure diagnostic clear diagnostic formulation so you can actually often get more resources at the preschool level than you can at the school level if you have a child with a more severe difficulty. Two things. First of all, wait list we have a long wait list. Uh, at the moment, I'm booking, I think, September, October, in terms of, which, isn't, well, which is long in private practice world, but not long in school board world, where you might be sitting for three years on a waiting list, uh, depending on your priority status that may shuffle over the years. Um, and so that's certainly where our practice is. And of course, I have a team in my practice, so it's not just me. Um, in terms of, so we're looking at you know, six to eight months often for an assessment. Uh, second question was more about on or off medication. I mean, in those people who are diagnosed, often in the course of an assessment, we want to do both. We want to see the child off medication at least for one hour in time. We may want to assess them on medication. If this is a family that's committed to medication, first of all, and is going to be using medication, we want their optimal performance. And if that optimal performance comes on medication, I want to know what can they do when they're medicated. But I also need to look at what's happening off medication as well in a full assessment. Often families come in with questions about medication. Is it working? Isn't it working? Well, unless I see them in both situations and do some standardized testing, both on and off medication, I can't even answer the question. Um, and many of our kids are under-medicated. Um, so we'll see kids where parents will say, sure, my child's on medication. Yeah, I want you to assess them on medication. Their medication may be five milligrams of Ritalin once a day, uh, short-acting, uh, first thing in the morning. And it, it's subtherapeutic and it's basically might as well have given them a vitamin um, in terms of managing. And parents don't always know about medication and medication effectiveness. The other thing that's really helpful in doing standardized testing when you see a kid on medication is that there are some kids, some parents who feel that medications um, blunt and zone their child out, some of the tests will pick up those a sluggishness and processing speed if a child may be over-medicated. So it's important to be able to kind of assess in different contexts on that issue. Actually, that's a really good question. My experience is, yes, it can change. However, the deficits do not disappear. What I often see is the pattern will elevate across the board. Because one of the things about our ADHD kids in a standardized psych assessment is they are consistently inconsistent. Which means that many of our measures start easy, they get progressively more difficult, they're designed so that all children do not get the right answers. Our ADHD kids, who's 10, misses the 6-year-old items and gets the 14-year-old items because they weren't focused, they weren't attending, or instead of getting a pattern of got it right, got it, got it right, gradually getting it worse, 
They get one, they miss two. They get three, they miss four. They get one, they miss two. And they go on and on and on. But their score is a sum score. So they'll look lower than they would have. And they get marginalized in terms of managing. However, we can't use that, the other, that argument the other way. If you have significant discrepancies between skills in one area and another, and we medicate you, the, dis the whole profile might move up. The discrepancies don't go away. So magically given medication does not cure your active working memory problems, does not cure your sequencing-based learning disability, does not eliminate your language-based LD. It helps you to attend. It gets rid of the inconsistencies. Absolutely. I had a youngster told me the medication took the cobwebs out of his brain. I thought that was a beautiful analogy because that's what it's doing for them. It allows them to think and process more fluidly. Yeah, I think it varies because it depends on what's happening in an educational program. And I, I'll say that because if you have a child who's doing really well, there's a good program in place, there's good educational supports, and they're at a transition, you've got a good working team, um, that there's good linkage between one school and the next school in terms of programming, you might wait till after the transition has come, and you might not hit every transition for reassessment. If you've got a you're already in a problem world and we're moving to another school, you absolutely want another assessment that will give you updated information because you're moving into a new team. And if you want to advocate with the new team, fresh data makes a difference. Go into a senior public school with an assessment done at grade two and they go, well, how do we know this is valid now? They don't. It doesn't help them, and it doesn't help them decide what are we going to do with reading comprehension now that we're having to read much more lengthy, complex materials and pull information out. At grade two, we're very much looking at decoding with reading. Some comprehension, but the type of comprehension that's needed to manage at the senior public level is very different. I hope that helps clarify. A child at senior kindergarten can't read. Absolutely, we aren't expecting them to be able to read. But there are things we are expecting them to be able to do. We're looking, when we're looking at processes, at the precursor processes to being able to read. So, for example, there are a number of pre-reading based phonological skills that you absolutely need to have to be a good reader by the time you get to school. Those can be assessed even in our preschool group. You're looking at precursor visual perceptual skills. Reading involves decoding of symbolic material. If you have deficits in your visual perceptual reasoning, you're going to have trouble acquiring that sound symbol recognition for reading. We can predict children that are going to have reading-based difficulties very early on based on their processes and procedures. There is correlation, again, between those processes. I said to you, reading is an achievement outcome. It's the processes that determine the learning-based issue, not the outcome. So you can assess prior to our expectation of reading to know what are our high-risk points. And in fact, there's a lot of literature, that's why we're going after early intervention with our kids heading into um, JK, SK, and grade one. We can intervene much more effectively on those precursor processes early when we've still got an evolving and rapidly changing brain. So that if we have children who have phonological deficits and we work very proactively on the pre-reading speech and language-based phonological skills, we get much better outcomes long term than if we're doing that very same intervention when the child's in grade two or grade three. Well, yes and no. Sometimes if you've got a ton of, do of documentation, 
I have to say, sometimes we tend to not do everything again. Um, and I say everything because we're a bit turtleish in our practice. So, you know, I give, you know, five or six different standardized rating scales that look at sensory issues and organization and attention and emotion and all of that stuff. But, you know, often by the time we're getting to post-secondary, it's pretty well documented what's happening. So you may just kind of give a summary. I'll give you one or, or a couple of rating scales instead of a bunch. With respect to the testing, often it's different because if your child's been assessed as a child, they will have been given a Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children, third edition. By the time we're hitting post-secondary, we're looking at adult scales of intelligence. They are fairly similar, but they are more difficult. They do load for different degrees of complexity in terms of managing. So yeah, it's often doing the same stuff over again. And not to say that the profiles totally change. I think generally in terms of our experiences that once children hit about 13, what you got is what you're going to get in terms of managing. So that there can be evolution and change in cognitive profiles, but around that time, you know, Piagetian terms, once we switch into those kind of formal operations, um, it's pretty much stays. So the pattern stays pretty consistent after that kind of adolescent age. Okay, well, the first thing you have to do is say, you know what, it doesn't sound like my child, right? First off. Second off, you can ask for a speech-language assessment as adjunctive in terms of what the school, what the school psychologist is doing. Third, you can start asking the psychologist questions. Okay, so they scored okay. Can you tell me a little bit about how they got there? Because I find, for example, that my kid, yeah, he knows what an apple or a bicycle is, but it takes him half an hour to explain it. Did you find that? Because often that's when they'll start to talk about process and that ability to organize. Those processes, for example, are central to written language, which is why our group has tons of difficulty in being able to produce. Why is writing such a high learning disability that we see amongst our kids with ADHD? Because writing is the most integrative process involved. You have to be able to organize, formulate, retrieve, and integrate information linguistically. You have to be able to motor coordinate and produce the information. You have to pay attention to multiple details like capitals, punctuation, grammatical structure let alone flow of ideas in terms of being able to manage and not leave words out. So writing is probably academically the most integrative process that kids have to do. So many kids who have higher order problems with those integrative functions are logically going to have trouble with the higher order functions of integration in writing particularly. We do see problems with many of our ADHD kids in reading, whether they fit the criterion for a reading disability or not. Often, again, some of our kids have trouble early on with acquiring decoding. Amongst our kids who de can decode well, it's being able to decode and process at the same time so they can read the story well but have no idea what, you, what was in the story, or the higher order comprehension of pulling out the main idea, drawing conclusions um, versus what is concretely in there, and anyone who works in the school system that knows that the curriculum from the junior grades on becomes progressively more about making inferences, not just knowing the facts. And it's that inferential part of reading and processing of reading which is really problematic for many of our ADHD folks. For language, okay, well, there's a whole variety of tests on the market, as we all have our own little preferences. Um, I like the SELF for the Clinical Evaluation of Langu Language Fundamentals, fourth edition, in part because they, there's a group of receptive and a group of expressive tasks on that particular test. Um, the receptive task has a number of things. One is a task called for older kids called semantic relations, where you're reading... Um, sequential based instructional information. The teacher said get out your book and find page 37. This may not be an actual item I'm generating without it in front of me. Um, before you get out your books, put your names down. After you get out your books, uh, do problems 1 to 10. What were the students supposed to do first? 
Okay, so they have to process sequential and temporal information. That's a really important kind of task amongst our ADHD kids. They also expressively, as an example, have a sentence formulation task where we show a child a picture, we give them a word, they have to produce a grammatically correct sentence using the picture and the word. The first couple of them are examples that are pretty easy, words like children and playing, but then most of the items are words like because, instead, although, however, where the child has to combine ideas. Kids with higher order formulation problems have huge difficulties with that ability to combine ideas and generate information. Um, it'll also pick up our kids that have run on sentences and tangential reasoning. But that's just one test. There are others on the market, but that's a good example. They, what, the Wyatt test, the other one that I didn't put down is really more of what they call that top scale up there where you've got 100, an average IQ is 100, so standard scores might be 100, 90, 80, 70. You see the top row? Standard scaled scores are the 1 to, one to the 19. The first top row that I didn't even label <laughs> says 55, 60, 65, 70. Those are the scores that you get in terms of a global standard score on a, on a Wyatt and or a WISC. So an IQ of 100 is the same as a percentile rank of 50, a stainine of 5, or a scaled score of 10. They're all the same. Well, it's, yes, but that's very hard because, you know, the WISC does have a French version, but if you live in Ontario, depending on the region, finding an assessor who can do it in French if they're in a French school is very difficult to do. Your ability shouldn't change, your achievement will. <laughs>